flow. Uh, thank you all for coming at, uh, to this presentation uh, here at the Holliston Council on Aging. My name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an elder law attorney. I work at a firm called Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us. There are 40 in Worcester and 20 in Westboro. Um, what I like about being at Myrick O'Connell is all I have to do is elder law. Everything else, there's somebody else who's smarter than me who can answer your questions. So we do it all, but this is all I do. Um, I've been coming here to Holliston now for a couple of years, uh, doing presentations on a variety of kind of specific topics. But then I had talked to your director and she said, you know, it would probably be good to do one kind of global presentation on all the things you need to be thinking about uh, if you're getting older, like me. Uh, my average client uh, looks a lot like Frank and Mary. Um, so I always say that these are my, this is my make-believe couple, Frank and Mary, and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., and I always say, if you get that joke, you're old enough to be my client. Uh, the younger ones, they're like, what? Right? Uh, and their goal in life is very simple. Um, they want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. Right? If one of them dies, they want all their assets, all things being equal, to go to the other one. And if the two of them have died, they want things to go to their kids. Right? Does that sound like a familiar type plan? And, and here are their assets. They own a house. It's not worth a lot. It's worth $300,000. They have an IRA that is worth about $150,000. i am just going to see if I can make it a little bit clearer. That's good. Uh, they have an annuity worth $100,000. They have bank accounts worth seventy five dollars for a total value of $625,000. Uh, he's on Social Security at $1,500 a month, and he gets a pension of $500. She's on uh, Social Security at $750, half of, of his. Uh, so they're doing okay. You know, unless they have some kind of serious problem that, that might really hit them, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on, if, they, if there are nursing home issues, they're going to be okay for the rest of their lives. So the question is, so what are their l law questions? You know, and, and so what, what, I, what I as an elder law attorney uh, am dealing with is all of the issues that these people might be thinking of to make sure that, first of all, they don't run out of money before they die, uh, and then secondly, that after they die, whatever they have goes where it's supposed to go. So what I always tell people right off the bat uh, when they're talking to me about, so, you know, in general, what documents do I need? The answer is you don't need a will in most cases, right? You sometimes do need a will. Often you don't. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, um, what you do really need, absolutely, is you need a health care proxy, you need a MOLST form, and you need a power of attorney. I bet you, you, you most of you know what two of those three forms are. You, every, every, raise your hand if you know what the MOLST form is. Raise your hand. One person, that's good. That's higher than usual, right? Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about those three forms a little bit, and then we're gonna talk about um, wills, or the point of wills, and alternatives to wills, et cetera. Um, so a healthcare proxy. You have to have a healthcare proxy. If you are incapacitated, meaning that your doctor says that you can't make a medical decision because you're in a coma, or because you had an accident, you're just feeling really confused, no one can make that decision for you, not your spouse, right? Doctors will let that slide a lot and let the spouse do it, but legally they can't. No one can make the medical decision for you uh, except a guardian that gets appointed by the probate court after a whole lot of wasted money and time, or the person you name in your health care proxy. The point of the health, and by the way, uh, advanced medic, so-called advanced medical directives, living wills, oh, if I get sick, this is what I want to have happen, totally invalid unenforceable in Massachusetts. They have no significance. Uh, and if, they, if you've written one of those, if you've given any specific instructions, they get overruled by the healthcare proxy who is your, at any time. So you have to have a proxy. Proxy is really simple, and I know you're gonna tell me, oh, I did one of these when I went to the hospital, right? And I made it out. Well, you know, when you got home from the hospital, the hospital threw that out, threw it away. They didn't keep that proxy. The only reason why they did it was because you didn't bring them one, and they wanted to make sure that if something bad happened while you were in the hospital, there was somebody they could talk to, right? So you want to have your own health care proxy. Typically what you want to do is give it to your doctor or give a copy to your doctor so that if there is an emergency and you go to the hospital, the doctor can email it or send it over to the hospital. Health care proxies are really easy to do. You need two witnesses. Um, the only, and they can be anybody, except if it's a person that works at the hospital, um, they have to be um, related to you. Otherwise, people at the hospital can't do these. Okay? Um, the, the point of the proxy is to allow somebody else to make medical decisions on your, uh, on your behalf. They take effect as soon as your doctor says that you're not capable of making a medical decision. They stop as soon as your doctor says, oh, they're better now. 
A uh, couple of things that come up regarding proxies. So I don't want to sign one of these because I don't want anybody to put me into a nursing home. That's what often my elder clients will say. And my answer is, well, don't worry about it because if you've given someone a healthcare proxy to make medical decisions on your behalf, and by the way, admission, the decision to admit to a nursing home is a healthcare decision technically, and so a proxy can make that decision, right? Except that that person should also get a power of attorney also because actually signing the contract with the, with the nursing home requires that you have a power of attorney. You need both documents, right? But if, you're, if you've signed your proxy and your daughter gets you to the nursing home and you just say, I don't want to go, I don't want to stay here, technically what you've just done is you've revoked your health care proxy uh, and, the, and the nursing home is not supposed to take you with, without a, unless there's a court order, right? That I just mentioned that because often my clients are on the other end of that, right? Like they've got a health care proxy and Ma really doesn't want to go, oh, what do I do? And I'll tell them, I'll say, well, you know, Usually it all works out, you know, so you may want to kind of bring her to the nursing home, get her accommodated. But if she says she doesn't want to be there, the nursing home is not supposed to take her, right? There's actually a court case that was on this. I'm going to answer all questions at the end, if that's okay. Um, a couple of other things. Uh, uh, interestingly, the health care, while the power of attorney that you sign dies with you, your health care proxy remains in effect as to one and only one thing, and that is organ donations. Uh, if you, um, if, at, following your death, uh, if you're at the hospital or at a nursing home or whatever, your body cannot be released to anybody until the New England Donor Bank, the entity in New England, in, actually it's located in Waltham, in charge of organ donations, has notified the hospital that, 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 that it's okay because they don't want your body, right? The person who can have the conversation with the donor bank to make the decision regarding whether or not your body should be available for having parts removed, right, is your proxy. The first choice is your proxy, then the personal representative if you have a will under your will, and after that the next of kin. The reason why I mention all of that is well, really two things. One, uh, if, you have, if you have not s s done anything in writing to the contrary, it is presumed that you're willing to make an organ donation, right? Until your, uh, until your proxy or somebody has said, no, they don't, we don't want donations to be made, right? And, and so if you get a call, if somebody <laughs> dies and, so, and you get a call from the, the organ bank, make sure you call them back, right? Because you, you don't want to avoid that call because until you make the call back, your body is going to stay at the hospital or it's going to stay at the, at the nursing home. So uh, ex except for that, though, your health care proxy dies with you. The MOLST form. M-O-L-S-T, Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, is the form that the Department of uh, Public Health has developed to, to replace the so-called DNR form, the old comfort care forms. They, I always was amazed they were called comfort care. It was the form that said, if, I, if I've stopped, my heart has stopped, don't bring me back. That was a DNR form. Well, the MOLST form contains a whole set of those kinds of what I'll call emergency uh, uh, type decision. So there's a line that says, don't bring me back, and you can check it off, you know, yes or no. <clears throat> there's one that says, don't intubate me. That is, if I have stopped breathing, don't force a pipe down my throat into my lungs and start pushing air into them to try to get me going again, right? Don't use certain kinds of drugs, right? Um, most um, significant to me, uh, don't take me to the hospital, right? Frank and Mary want to die at home. If you want to die at home, then that means you want to die at home, which means if you've had a medical problem and you're on the floor and the, and, the, and the EMT shows up, you don't want them to bring you to the hospital because you want to die at home. Because if they bring you to the hospital, the hospital will do everything they can to save you. Just everything they can. The reason is, um, first of all, doctors, that's how doctors are built. Doctors want to save people. They don't want to let people go. I mean, I deal with a lot of doctors, and they just don't, you know. The other reason is the hospital. Um, for many years, I was on the board at our hospital, at Marlboro Hospital, up the street. And, and, and monthly, we'd have these meetings, and uh, we'd talk about finances and this and that. And then we had a, a report on how many people died in our hospital that month, right? Because we didn't want that number high, because if it gets high, you know, Department of Public Health is calling, and we got let you letters from JCO, the, the, uh, the, the federal regulator. They do not want you to die in their hospital, 
right? So if you want to die at home, or if you just want to die what we'll call naturally, as opposed to kind of being stuck on machines and stuff, you probably don't want to go to the hospital. So uh, where do you put that, by the way? Always on the refrigerator. Why is that? That seems like kind of random. Well, it's because all of the ambulance drivers, that's what they get trained to do. The protocol, if you're an ambulance person going into your home is, this is an emergency, right? You're, you know, you're walking in the house, there's the lady on the floor, what do you do? You know, you're not going to be searching drawers, you know? So they said, the protocol is look at the refrigerator, if it's not there, forget it, right? You bring her back, because the protocol is, unless there's a do not resuscitate, you're going to bring her back, or you're going to bring her to the hospital, you're going to do whatever you can to save somebody. Technically, a, a, a most form is a doctor's form, really not your form. You're assenting to it, but it's really a doctor's order. Um, to these other people down the food chain, the nurses and the EMTs, et cetera, saying, here's what you do. And so it always has to be signed by your doctor, uh, although it gets witnessed by you. If you want to find one of these, you can see it online or call your doctor. Your doctors have all got these. And they are being urged regularly by the Department of Public Health to talk to you about this and try to get this straightened out. Okay? Um, finally, no matter what your most form says, your proxy can always overrule it at any time. You're on the floor, and they find the, the thing, oh, don't resuscitate, but your daughter, the proxy, is there and says, oh, no, I really want you to bring Ma back. You're coming back. You know, they're going to they're gonna do it. So the reason why I say that is, once again, these, all these advanced directives, all that stuff, they're just they're, they're meaningless, meaningless. What you really need to do is sign a proxy, ha, you know, have, it, have, you, have your doctor have it, have you have it, and then talk to your proxy, right, and say, here's how I want to be treated. You know, here's, here are my thoughts about this, and I'm counting on you to, to, to do this. And hopefully you have someone that you can trust enough to do that, okay? Um, these are some of the things that we talked about, the kinds of decisions that get made on the most form. Uh, I talked about the fact that the alternative to this is guardianship, and it's terrible. Power of attorney. The other document you have to have, you have to have, you know, everybody should have it, but as you get older, you know, there's more of a chance that you're going to, you know, I have a stroke or get, you're just getting older, you know? And so you need to make sure that if you're incapacitated, somebody can make, can make legal decisions for you and sign things like your checks, right? Or pay your bills or talk to your bank or talk to, your, talk to anybody, right? S sign you in if you need to be signed into a hospital or a nursing home or whatever. Just have the legal ability to act for you. That's what a power of attorney does. Uh, powers of attorney, by the way, um, automatically take effect at the time you sign them unless there's something in the power of attorney that says this doesn't take effect until I'm incapacitated. We never recommend that put, people put that language in. I have this case literally this week. Somebody came in and we're, try, we're trying to deal with all these issues. Somebody is incapacitated and we've got to be trying to shift some assets around and do this and that in order to qualify them for mass health. And they've got a power of attorney from the old person. But it says only takes effect if I'm incapacitated, which means I now have to try to get a doctor's certificate, right, in order to be able to demonstrate any of this stuff, right? And it's just a pain, right? So the better way to handle that, if you're worried about the person you've given this power of attorney to misusing it, is probably to have your, your lawyer hold it, have somebody hold it. Uh, I often hold, we often hold these with escrow agreements, with an agreement with my client that says, don't, don't you release the document until you're convinced that I'm really incapacitated, right? But the document now is all done. You know, it's in my office, it's all ready to go, right? Ideally, you have somebody that you can trust and you know isn't going to abuse it, and you just give them an original. Um, do notaries have to be wit witnessed or notarized? No, they don't, actually. Um, unless, unless the notary is being given power to sign deeds or mortgages or other things involving real estate that get recorded in the registry, now, as a practical matter, you don't really need them witnessed here. Uh, unless you're going out of state, if you go to Florida, Florida requires witnessing, and so you want a power of attorney. If you're traveling to states that might require witnesses, or if you're living for prolonged periods outside, you may want them. Notarization is not required, but you always want one. Now, the reason for that is, and if you've been to my presentations, you heard, you know, we're all getting old, so we repeat, right? So my daughter once gave me a T-shirt. My daughter, who's now with a big-time lawyer at Wilmer Hale, right? Um, who, when she was little, gave me a T-shirt that said, the good lawyer knows the law, the great lawyer knows the judge. Now, in the case of a power of attorney, there's a lot of truth to that. You know, in the case of a power of attorney,
the judge isn't like a real judge, right? It's like the guy at the bank, you know? So you're, you, you know, you're incapacitated and your daughter's at the bank line and I want to cash a check for my mom. And, and the bank teller looks at your, the power of attorney and goes, uh, I wonder if this is valid. You know, I don't know if this is valid. Well, there's something about a notary seal, right? That just makes everybody think it's a valid legal document. So that's the only reason why you get them notarized, basically, is so that they look like they're really legal. Um, a couple of other things, gifting. Um, for the purposes of a lot of the work that I do, um, which is uh, helping people do asset restructuring if there were emergency situations involving nursing home care, it's really important that the person with the power of attorney has the ability on behalf of the person who has the assets to transfer things, right? Sometimes to transfer things to themselves, but often to transfer things to the spouse, to transfer things to somebody else. Um, and the reason why I say that is many powers of attorney that were do are done by attorneys, that I've seen have been done by attorneys, won't have this general gifting provision in there, right? They'll have a gifting provision that will say, uh, my attorney is allowed to make gifts, but only to my relatives and only in an amount that doesn't exceed the federal estate, the federal gift tax exemption, which is now $14,000, which is a truly irrelevant exemption, but that's not part of this presentation. The main thing is that that power of attorney, which I just bumped into, is valueless to me if I'm trying very hard to restructure someone's assets by moving fifty, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars and transferring a house and doing things we need to do in order to qualify that person for mass health. So you want to have a gift and that needs to be specifically in there. If it's not in there, it's presumed that the, the attorney can't make gifts. Uh, Self-dealing. If you want the, the person you're named, naming to be able to give something to themselves, even if it's your spouse, you have to say that right in the power of attorney. Joint and several. Whereas healthcare proxies, you can only name one person at a time. Like I'm going to name so and so to make my medical decisions and if they're not around I name the next person down the list. And the reason is that for that is if I'm the doctor, I don't ever want to have to talk to two people about what the decision's going to be. Right? Powers of attorney, you can name more than one people at the same, did I say more than one people? That's not good. You can name more than one person at the same time and you can name them either jointly or jointly and severally. Jointly means they both have to sign the document, like you don't trust them, you know, so you want them to both sign. Or jointly and severally means either one of them can sign the document. So that way, if you're naming like your spouse and one of your kids, so that if, if, if your spouse is also incapacitated, now you know your child is right there. Or if you're naming two of your kids because you know they travel sometimes and you want to make sure somebody can sign the document. So that's joint and several. Uh, the alternative to that, if you haven't done that and someone has to do things on your behalf, is to get appointed as a conservator. Same problem, it's gonna cost you about $10,000, it can involve family fights, they're terrible, right? You can totally avoid all those problems with just a very simple power of attorney. Now, I'm gonna talk about probate a little bit. Um, and the reason why many people do a lot of their estate planning is in order to avoid that, to avoid probate. Oh, I really want to avoid probate. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit because um, it's not so bad, right? But first of all, let me tell you what probate applies to. The purpose of the probate process is to find out, is to decide who gets to own something that was owned by a dead person before they died. That's the kind of simple version. So it does not include assets that were not owned only by the dead person before they died. Things like things that were owned jointly. So if you own your house jointly with your spouse, uh, or if you have bank accounts jointly with somebody else. The reason for that is the legal assumption or the, 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 when you say jointly with rights of survivorship, what that means is that each of the owners of the property owns 100% of it. So if you own something jointly with your spouse, you don't each own half. You each own the whole thing legally, subject to the fact that the other one does too. So that if one person dies, that person's interest simply evaporates, leaving the other person as the sole owner, okay? So houses, bank accounts, life insurance policies, things where there's a named death beneficiary, IRAs, 401ks, which you, you think that you might own, but you really don't. Actually, the bank owns that, or the company that's got the money, you just have the right to get it, right? So it's owned by a third party, and those accounts always come with death beneficiaries. So those accounts, too, would not be covered. So, so what, going back to Frank and Mary's assets, there, there are the assets that Frank and Mary own. If, if Mary were to die today, uh, could you raise your hand, tell me how many people think there would need to be a probate regarding her estate if she died? None. You're right. You're right. 
No probate required. House was joint. The, the IRA, as we said, there's going to be a death beneficiary, Mary. The annuity and the bank accounts are all joint. If Mary dies the next day, there has to be a probate. Because how do we figure out who's supposed to get to own these assets? The house, uh, maybe the IRA, unless there's another death beneficiary there, and the annuity and the bank account, right? So it may be that probate is necessary, but you can, you can, there are ways to avoid probate. Um, so, so the question then is, if you're, and, and oftentimes these issues come up if, if you're married, because if you're Frank and Mary, we just went through the list, right? If one of them dies, if you want to leave everything to the other one, you don't, you don't really need a will because the other one's going to inherit everything. And by the way, one other kind of parenthetical thing, tangible personal property. Well, what happens to the things in the house, right? Well, the answer is that always gets straightened out. You know, one spouse dies, the other spouse owns all the stuff in the house. The other spouse dies and the kids divide it up. I mean, you can have a will, and the only reason why anybody would go to probate would be if two people were fighting over that priceless, you know, piece of china, you know, or the bed or whatever. Then the only way to solve that would be by going to probate court. But it never happens. You know, I've been doing this, this is my 39th year doing this. It's never happened, right? So you don't, you don't have to waste your money to try to figure out through a will or whatever how to divide up the tangible personal property. The only other issue is the, the car, right? The car. Oh, so, oh, I'll go back to that. So if you're just married, Frank has died, now you're just married. Now do you need a will, right? Because, you, well, the answer is, the question is, you know, how do you want to divide things up? If you simply want to make sure that when you die, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. are going to divide up the assets, well, you don't need a will. And the reason for that is, um, the, the state has already written that will for you, right? There is, a, there is a state written, there is a state statute that specifies the so-called rules of intestacy, the rules regarding where property goes if you die without a will, right? And it says, and basically, those are the rules that apply unless you have a will. And the rules say, when, the, when one spouse dies, the other spouse gets everything, and if the other spouse dies, then the kids divide it up. So that's exactly what you would have put in your will if you were Frank and Mary. So in that case, you really don't need a will. Um, now, once again, you want to talk to your attorney about that because there are some exceptions. If you had been divorced before, if there are kids by a prior marriage, blah, blah, blah. But there are three or four other kind of major things that you may want to have as the reason to have a will. If, you're, if one of your children has creditor problems, right? Well, you don't want to leave you know, all this money to the child's creditors, you know, which is what happens. If you leave it to them, well, then the creditors can go after the money, right? Or you, know, you don't want to leave it to that daughter-in-law that you really never liked in the first place, you know, and they were always fighting, and you figure they get, they, you, know, you die, and then they're going to get divorced. And now, if you left everything to your son, well, all of a sudden, those assets are going to be in play in the divorce, right? Or if your child has a disability. Suppose your child needs to qualify for Mass Health or SSI or some other program for which he needs to show that he doesn't have a lot of assets. Well, in all of those cases, you can avoid the trouble that you wanted by putting money in trust, by saying in your will that you're going to take the share that was going to go to this particular child and instead say that asset is going to get held in trust for the benefit of my child. But to do that, if you're going through the probate court, if, you're, if you own that asset, you're going to need to put that, those trust provisions right into the will. So those are the reasons why you might. Or finally, the house. So you die and you've got a house. And you've got four kids and you say, well, I want to leave the house to my four kids. Now, is that really what you want? Or do you want to make sure that when the house gets sold, the money gets divided up, right? Because if that's what you want, right, then you may want to put it in a will. Um, because if you simply leave the house to the four kids, and this happens a lot, and now you go to sell the house, now everybody's got a veto. All four kids have to sign that deed. So if three of them think that the right price is 300,000, but the other one thinks it's really 425, right? And you can't convince them, you can't convince them. You can't sell the house. You're stuck with the house. The only alternative for the other three kids then is to file something called a petition to partition real estate in court, spend 10, $20,000 in legal fees, have the court order that the house gets sold and the proceeds get distributed. An easier way is to have, a, in, have it in your will that following your death, all of your assets get divided to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. But regarding the house, the house gets sold and the proceeds get divided between among the three of them. Okay, does that all make sense? So there may be some reasons why you want to do a will. If you don't, well, there are a lot of ways around it. Um, 
One, as I mentioned, is joint ownership. Anything that is owned by Mary and one of her kids jointly, when she dies, her interest evaporates, her child becomes the owner of the property. By the way, that's most significant often with, regarding the car. Regarding the car. Even if you die, in, die owning a car in your own name and you have a spouse, there's a special state statute that says that there's a presumption that you own that, house, that car jointly. So the surviving spouse just, can just bring the death certificate to the registry of motor vehicles and they'll switch the title. Not so between a parent and children, right? If your parent dies owning the house own, or owning the car, you have to go through probate to get someone named the owner of that car so that they can sell that car. You know, and just what you need, you know, it's like a $3,000 car and it's gonna cost you a couple thousand dollars to get the probate certificate, right? So beware of that. Joint ownership, life estates. Many, many people, many single people, uh, when they're doing um, mass health related planning or asset protection planning for nursing home purposes, will transfer their home um, uh, or, or the so-called remainder interest in their home to their children. So they'll give their children all of the ownership in that house that starts the moment that they die. They'll keep something called a life estate, the ownership of the house until they die, right? Um, if you structure things that way, then when you die, there are, there are mass health benefits to that, but for probate purposes, your interest simply evaporates, poof, it disappears, and the children become the sole owners of the property. So um, there are ways that you can structure all of those things. How about the stuff in the house? We were just talking about that, right? The stuff that's in the house. Well, if you're concerned about how that stuff might get divided up, right? You might want to just do a letter. Just do a letter. Maybe have it notarized, you know, so pretend that it looks official, right? But do a letter to your kids that say, this is how I'd like you to do it. If you're really worried about it, then have a will and have the will, which most wills do, have a provision that says that the, that the, that the personal property, the so -called, that's called tangible personal property, is going to get divided up among the kids as they agree, or if they can't agree, the personal representative decides. Personal representative used to be called the executor or executrix, right? And then if you had that provision in the will, and, and that's the only thing that has to get divided up, you know the kids aren't going to probate the will, right? Because they're going to say, look, there are two choices. We can either simply divide up the stuff, right? Um, or we can probate the will, which says, just divide up the stuff, you know? And, and so why am I spending all this money on Arthur Bergeron? You know, why don't I just divide up the stuff? So once again, I've never had a case that goes to pro that went to probate over the tangible personal property. You could do that. You can also do something called a chattel deed or bill of sale. You can actually do a deed to whoever you want to leave that property to. If there are particular items that you think that are of real value and you don't want them to be kind of in play, well, you know, do a, do a deed to them right now. Give them to your kids right now. You keep them in your house, but give them the title, you know, a little a document that says that they have title to them. Um, this is another alternative for avoiding probate. Mary could, if she wanted, if she didn't want to have her house held jointly with somebody else, she wanted to keep control of the house, she could do this. This is the most common way of doing this. Is she could create a trust. A trust defines a relationship between two kinds of people. A trustee, who is a legal owner of stuff, uh, and beneficiaries. The legal owner is the legal owner for the benefit of the beneficiaries. If you own something, if you own real estate in fee, if you own something outright, that means that you have both the legal ownership, that is the ability to sell it if you want, and the equitable ownership, the, right, the beneficial ownership, the right to use the house, right? Through a trust, you're kind of splitting those things. So the easiest mechanism for avoiding probate, if that's your only issue, is Mary simply creates a trust, names herself as the trustee for the benefit of herself and her children or whoever she wants, and says it's revocable, it's amendable, she can do whatever she wants as long as she's alive. But she says in the trust document, when I die, um, I, I'm naming so-and-so to replace me as trustee, typically one of the kids, typically the one that would have been the personal representative under the will, right? And the legal effect of that is when she dies, the house doesn't have to go through probate, right? Because it's not just owned by her, it's owned by her as the trustee of this trust. And so legally upon her death, the new trustee is right named right in the trust and it takes effect right away and then trustee can the next day go sell the property and divide up the proceeds, right? So it's, it is, for, for those assets where you're uncomfortable having them held jointly, that's probably the best alternative. Is there anything bad about that? Well, well they, they, for tax purposes, it's totally neutral. Having assets held by you and trust that way is the exact same thing as owning them yourself 
as far as the IRS and the Department of Revenue are concerned. They're called grantor taxable trusts. So there's no new other tax returns. There's no difference in tax treatment, none of that stuff. For mass health purposes, it also doesn't do anything. So if you need to qualify for mass health because you're, trying to, you're in a nursing home or you're trying to qualify for this program called the Frail Elder Waiver that will provide benefits to you at home if you're otherwise eligible for a nursing home, well, as far as mass health is concerned, just like the IRS, you still own those assets, right? They're still in your control. Um, I, I kind of emphasize this because we're going to talk a little bit about mass health at the end. But a lot of times, and it happened to me once again, again, the advantage of doing nothing but elder law is you just get more, just, I, do, I do a lot of cases. Um, and, and, and yet again, somebody came in who, whose mother, you know, had gone to the lawyer and, and had said, you know, she, she thought she said that she wanted these assets protected as far as mass health was concerned, but she wanted to avoid probate. And you can't do them both in this kind of situation. And so she had a trust, which was revocable and amendable, which would have avoided probate. But unfortunately, right now, she's in an assisted living heading to a nursing home. And the house is on Martha's Vineyard. And it's worth a lot of money. And it's countable. It's 100% countable, right? So it's still countable. OK, now a little bit about mass health. So maybe 90% of the people that I talk to are in my office because they're either worried about getting Alzheimer's or they have Alzheimer's or somebody that they know has Alzheimer's. And they realize that Alzheimer's is the one major disease, this is why everybody fears it, that is not covered by Medicare. Medicare is health insurance for the old. You all get it. Well, just about everybody here, I think, gets it. Um, and it covers, it, but it's health insurance. So it covers the cost of getting better and it covers the cost of skilled services and D drugs and things that are health, think, thought to be health related. And so it's going to cover you. If you've got cancer, you've got diabetes, you've got any of the major diseases except Alzheimer's, uh, it's going to cover all of your issues. But if you have Alzheimer's or one of the other diseases that causes dementia, so that the care you need is not medical care, it's not skilled care, it's, the, it's, it's help putting on your pants and eating. And, and, and having somebody around to make sure that you don't drift out into the street by, by mistake and die, you know, well, that's not skilled care as far as Medicare is concerned, and therefore it's not covered, which is why if you go to a nursing home, Medicare won't cover any of your days at the nursing home unless you started off by going to a hospital, getting admitted, and being there for at least three days. And even then, when you get to the nursing home, Medicare will not cover more than 100 days in the nursing home, because at that point, as far as they're concerned, you're not getting better. And Medicare covers the cost of getting better, not the cost of staying the same. So this is this, there is this, this, this defect in Medicare. And it was a politically intentional, it wasn't overlooked. Um, when Medicare was created in the 60s, this issue came up. Shouldn't we be covering nursing home care? Shouldn't we be covering these kinds of needs? But the answer was, it's going to cost too much money, it's going to kill the bill. So LBJ, Lyndon Johnson, did not put it in. And that's why it wasn't in the Medicare bill. And then when Obamacare came up, the same conversation happened. While we're redoing the, 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 finance, the system, why don't we include these issues? It's going to cost too much money. So they kept it out, which is why people deal with MassHealth. So MassHealth, which is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program, federal program which is health insurance for the poor as opposed to health insurance for the, for the old, right? Um, does cover the cost of skilled nursing care. If you qualify for MassHealth and you're in a nursing home, MassHealth will pay the difference between um, whatever your income is from uh, pension and Social Security and whatever the nursing home bill is, right? So it's the place, it, and, and this is the reason why over 80% of all people in all nursing home beds today are on MassHealth. All nursing homes take MassHealth. There aren't like special ones for the rich and others for the, everybody takes it and everybody lives on mass health. So the question is how does, if, and so when you, if you're talking to me about this, you need to know some of these rules. So mass health 101, remember there's Frank and Mary again, there are their assets, total 625 and there's their income. So what if today Mary needs nursing home care and they've got these kinds of assets, right? How many people here think that they're going to need to spend down some of those assets before Mary can qualify for mass health. Raise your hand. Ah, you're all wrong. And the answer to that, for the, and, and, and this is always, this is more of a kind of a surprise to people. Um, the reason for that is the rules are, if you're trying to qualify for mass health, 
the person who is trying to qualify, the person in the nursing home, has to show they're poor. And poor, there's a definition of poor. You have to have countable assets of less than $2,000. That's really low, right? However, if you're married, the spouse at home doesn't have to be poor. The spouse at home can own the home itself as long as it has a, a, an equity value of less than $828,000, which pretty much takes care of everybody that doesn't live on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket, where I do a lot of work and that's more of an issue. Everybody's house is a million dollars. But for most people, house is safe. You can also have cash, cash or cash equivalent assets equal to $119,220. By the way, these numbers just come from the sky. You know, they're, they, they get changed by the federal government. They're, these are today's numbers, but sometimes they change. In addition to that, the spouse at home can have unlimited income, unlimited income. So there are asset limits, but all they're kind of high, but no income limit. So Frank and Mary, if Mary needs nursing home care, what they do is they're going to, if they are going to shift all the assets to Frank, all of that, all of those assets, right? Then we you see, we've, so that makes the house safe. And now we've got this other $325,000 worth of assets. So what we're going to do with those, we're going to have Mary, we're going to have Frank, uh, keep $100,000 and take the other $225,000 and buy an annuity. An annuity. What is an annuity? It is a, um, it is a specific kind of annuity. There are, you get sold all kinds by the guy that's trying to sell you the annuities pretending they're your financial planner. I won't go there. Uh, the point is there is a particular kind of annuity, one that says that the company is going to pay you back uh, equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than your actuarial life expectancy. If Frank takes his other $225,000 and buys an annuity that has those characteristics, it's going to pay him equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than his actuarial life expectancy, the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. And the day after he buys it, thereby reducing his assets below this magic number, $119,220, Mary's eligible for Mass Health because she has less than $2,000 and he has less than the necessary uh, asset limits. Right? By the way, if Frank is 89 years old, uh, his actuarial life expectancy is five years, which means this would all work just fine for him. Right? He would take that $225,000, he'd get monthly payments over the next five years or 60 months uh, equal to that amount plus a very small interest rate. You would never buy these annuities ever because they're a great investment. Never. The returns are terrible. You're only buying them to do this. As a matter of fact, they're actually called Medicaid qualifying annuities. You call the companies, they'll tell you. That's what they're called. And, and you can specify in that annuity contract that if Frank dies, right, his beneficiary can be anybody he wants. It can be his kids, it can be anybody, it can be me, it can be anybody it wants. And, and Mass Health has no claim on this money, right? As far as recovering any of Mary's Mass Health costs are concerned. So that's what they can do. So um, one thing though, <clears throat> you know, well, maybe I'm going to do that slide first. No, I'm going to go back there. Uh, I'm just going to mention this. So. Most of my people who are talking to me are talking to me about this issue, but they're also saying, but you know, I really want to avoid probate, right? And I want to protect my assets. You cannot do those two things at the same time, right? If you take nothing else away from this presentation, remember that. You can't avoid probate if you're a couple and at the same time try to protect things for the benefit of the surviving spouse. So now I'll tell you how to protect them. Um, let's see, what is that one there? Okay. So what Frank needs to do, if he wants to protect the assets for Mary's benefit, right, is he needs to have a will that says, instead of everything going to Mary, and remember that's what his original will was, right? Everything goes to Mary, and then if she's dead, everything gets divided up by the, to the kids. His will needs to say, everything is going to go in trust for Mary's benefit. And the trust involved has to be part of the will. It has to be an asset, well, we, I just refer to them as asset protection trusts, because that's the point of it but it has to be part of the will, a so-called testamentary trust, part of the will, not a living trust, not a trust that's separate from the will. You can't have a, a will that pours things into a living trust. It has to be that the assets end up in this testamentary trust. If Frank does that, and then he dies owning all the assets here, either before or after Mary is in the nursing home, right? all of the assets will be safe. He can name one of his kids, Peter, Paul, or Mary Jr. as the trustee of this trust, 
They can have the discretion to distribute some or all of the assets to Mary if they want to. So in this situation, if Mary weren't in the nursing home, but were still at home, and Frank you know, had this will, and, and we made sure that all the assets were owned by Frank before he died, then upon his death, all the assets would be safe. Suppose we named Mary, as, Mary Jr. As the, as, the, as, the, as the trustee. If, if, if Mary, the mother, really wanted some assets or wanted the house back, Mary Jr. could just deed her the house back, right? Now, if she did that, and then Mary Sr. needed to qualify for Mass Health, well, that house would get leaned. And if she had cash, that, house, that money would have to get spent down to less than $2,000. But the point is, all the assets that are in trust would be all safe, would all be safe. So, the only, so if, if you're Frank and Mary and you're trying to figure out what you're doing, and this is your big issue, is this asset protection, you need the will with the asset protection provisions. You have to make sure you have powers of attorney. We already talked about the reasons for powers of attorney. Well, one reason, remember we were just talking about the fact that if Mary went into the nursing home, the way we were going to qualify her for Mass Health, right, was we were going to shift any of her assets over to Frank. Well, but how can Frank do that if he doesn't have a power of attorney for Mary? So you've got to make sure there's a power of attorney there. Um, it, in some cases, um, in addition to doing those wills, couples will actually stack the assets ahead of time. So they'll say to themselves, well, you know, there's a much greater likelihood that Frank is going to die before Mary. Why? Because Frank might be 10 years older than Mary. Or Frank may have a history of heart attacks or whatever. And so the, the, the couple may decide ahead of time, okay, we're going to put all the assets in Frank's name right now, just in case. Because we've got to make sure they're in his name before he dies in order to make sure that Mary is safe. Most couples, though, will not do that. Most couples who have these wills in place will simply leave the assets the way they are in their own names, joint, often jointly. And, they'll, and I'll tell them, I'll say, so let me know if somebody gets sick, you know, if, if somebody, if, if, so that it, because you can restructure those assets at that point at any time. You can literally put all the assets into Frank's name the day before he dies, and then they'll be, and they'll be safe as far as Mary is concerned. By the way, just one, one thing, whenever I'm going through this, people are always, in the back of their minds, they keep hearing, five-year look-back period, five-year look-back period. Isn't there a five-year, the answer is no. There is no look-back period regarding transfers between spouses, and that's why while both Frank and Mary are alive, if one of them needs nursing home care, you can just shift everything day before you apply for mass health. And, and similarly regarding these wills, right? Once that will is in place, once Frank has that will in place, um, you can literally shift things into Frank's name the day before he dies, and, if, and, and then um, if he dies, all the assets are safe for Mary's benefit immediately. There's no look-back regarding any of that stuff. Okay, so now, suppose Frank has died though, and we don't have those options, therefore, re pre regarding protecting assets. If you're a couple, you can do all of this asset protection, you don't have to worry about a thing. If Frank is dead, and it's just Mary, and now she's interested in trying to deal with that, and now those are her assets, remember those are the same assets, she just inherited everything, well now she's got more of a problem, right? Because the only person you can give things to without that five-year look-back period having an effect is your spouse. So one possibility is she could get remarried. I always suggest this to my clients. They never do it. No one's ever, ever done it. Right? You can solve the problem right off the last minute. You can just solve the problem. right? Um, so the more typical thing that they'll do is, first of all, they'll say, well, if you're in Mary's case, you'll say, well, geez, I got, I got you know, a house. And it's worth 300000 And I got 325000 in these other assets. I really don't want to lose control of my other assets, you know. But my house, you know, as long as I can live there, right? <coughs> and I want to make sure, and if I go to the nursing home, oh, well, I'll have to suck it up. We'll have to spend down the money. But I'd like the house to go to my kids, by which she really means I'd like the kids to be able to sell the house and divide up the money. So the most typical protection plan for a single person is, in that case, that Mary would either simply deed, her, deed this so-called remainder interest, which we talked about before, to her kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., but keep a life estate in the property so that she'll have total control in terms of nobody can throw her out, right, as long as she's alive. Um, and she'll have to keep paying the bills because she is, has the life estate. So she becomes, she's still responsible for taxes and insurance and everything else, right? But upon her death, um, her interest in the life estate evaporates, the life estate evaporates, the kids become the sole owners. And five years after she's done that transfer of the remainder interest to her kids, 
um, the remainder interest is no longer a countable asset because it was deeded away more than five years before you applied for Mass Health, right? The, the, the life estate is still a countable asset. Um, and so if, the, if, she ended up, if Mary ended up going to a nursing home more than five years after she did this, Mass Health would, would qualify her because she's allowed to own a home or this life estate in it, but they'll put a lien on her life estate. And if the house gets sold during her lifetime, Mass Health is gonna be entitled to a piece of the proceeds equal to the value of the life estate. But as long as you hold the house until Mary dies, upon her death, the life estate evaporates. And therefore, so does the lien, because the lien is only on the life estate, right? So th that's a very common thing that, that Mary, in this case, would do. If she is also interested in, in saving her other assets, um, the way she, will, she, she could do something similar, but not quite the same. She would transfer her assets to one of her kids, make a gift of the assets to one of her kids. And in her situation, there's no gift tax regarding any of this, right? No gift tax. And the receipt of a gift is not income. So there's nothing bad that happens for tax purposes if Mary does this. And then you would have one of the kids, typically, because there were three kids, turn around and set up a trust, naming himself or herself, say all the money were given to Mary, then Mary would set up a trust naming himself or herself as the trustee for the benefit of herself and the other siblings, right? Knowing, because she's made this promise to her mother, that if the mother needs the money back, she as the trustee will distribute the money to one of the kids, make a legitimate distribu distribution of the trust money to one of the kids, and the kids will turn around and, and give the money back to the mother. So now, of course, you only do this if you really trust your kids, right? I, as I always say, that's why they call them trusts. If this is gonna do, you have to trust the trustee, right? Because you cannot have your cake and eat it too. You can't put this money into a place where for mass health purposes it doesn't count, but where you still have the legal right to get it back. You can't do that, okay? So you can do all of these things. Now, in both of those, in, in, I'm gonna go back to the house case. Remember I said, well, you know, you could just deed the house to the three kids and you could keep a life estate. But what if you're concerned, like I was mentioning before, you know, I deed the, th the house to the three kids and then I die, they're gonna fight over the sale of the house, right? How do I make sure that that doesn't happen? Well, in that case, a common mechanism is that instead of having the house, the, the, the remainder interest in the house go to the kids, you would, create a, the, 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 you would create a trust. You would create, and you'd name one of the kids as the trustees of the trust, the one you trust the most. And you tell that child, you tell that child, um, and you put, put the rules right in the document and say, you know, when I die, you're going to sell a house and divide up the money, right? And that way they're going to do it, right? Um, in general, especially, and that's okay regarding the house because you're keeping an interest in the house. Don't do that regarding your other assets. Do not transfer your other assets directly to your kids as the trustees of an irrevocable trust. It's just a bad idea, even if it's got all these other rules in it because these are being increasingly challenged by mass health. So they're just going to give you a hard time. And if you transfer the money directly into the irrevocable, into the trust, um, even if five years have gone by, right, um, you're still going to have to report that trust to Mass Health, And so they're going to get a chance to check the wording of the trust to see if there's something wrong with it. Whereas if you gave the asset to your kids and then your kids created the trust, five years after you gave it to your kids, the only thing that you have to report is that you gave money to your kids, right? The trust, as far as Mass Health, doesn't exist is concerned doesn't exist. So that's the reason why you do that stuff. Um, by the way, as I, as in this case, if you're structuring things that way, if, you're, if you are transferring the house and leaving a remainder interest to the kids or having that in the, in the name of a trust, and then transferring the cash out and having the kids set up the trust for the benefit of each other, as I explained, that, that would also avoid probate. So if you're a single person, the things that you need to do in order to protect the assets may also end up allowing you to avoid probate. That's the good news. The bad news is you have to wait five years for anything to have been succeeded, right? If you're a couple, you can protect things right now for the benefit of each of you. You don't have to do any asset restructuring. You don't have to lose any control of anything, and that's all the good news, but the bad news is you're gonna to have to go through probate. Um, one other thing. Uh, there is a section of the law that you may have heard of called uh, outside section 11, uh, which has been talked, this is the most talked about thing among elders right now. 
Um, to understand outside section 11, of the, this is an outside section of the governor's budget. When the governor proposes a budget, governor, most of the budget is just a bunch of lines that says, I want to spend this much for this and this much for this. But then there are these other sections called outside sections, which are typically changes to the law, but they have some fiscal impact, like changes to the law that, like, it, like that in this case, would increase the ability of MassHealth to get money back from you after you're dead that they had paid on your behalf. Uh, it's called expanded estate recovery. So the current law is that, um, uh, is, oh, am I gonna do this? Yeah, under the current law, uh, if, Ma if, if, Ma if Mary uh, were in the nursing home and we had, we had, we had uh, if we hadn't shifted all the assets, suppose we, sh we shifted all the assets to Frank, under current law, if she dies, MassHealth would have a claim against her probate estate to get money back that they had paid on her behalf. Um, but in this case, she wouldn't have any assets because she shifted it all to Frank. And Frank wouldn't have any, and they wouldn't have any claim against Frank, right? Because they never gave any money to Frank. They just gave money to Mary. Under current law also, if Frank had died and then Mary went into the nursing home, right? Um, but she had done the thing where she kept the life estate and gave the remainder interest to the kids upon her death, MassHealth would have a claim against the probate assets, but as we discussed, there would be nothing in probate in that case. Because remember, when you have a life estate, when you die, you're, the, the, the life estate evaporates, right? <coughs> well, the, 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 the outside budget section, which we've talked about what that is, does two things. First of all, it says that in, in that Mary case, if she died owning a life estate, whatever the value of that life estate was at the moment before her death, before her death, MassHealth would continue to have a claim against that house to collect that amount from those house proceeds, right? So if Mary, and, and if Mary's a 90-year-old person, her life estate right now, her life estate value is worth about 15% of the value of the house. So if she had a $300,000 house and she died and she had take, taken care of it this way but kept a life estate, MassHealth would have a $45,000 claim against that house to get reimbursed. Um, and that's number one. Number two, after she dies, if Frank later dies, which of course Frank will sooner or later do, right? No matter when he dies, if he dies the next day, if he dies the next month, if he dies 10 years later, MassHealth will have a claim against his probate assets for the entire amount that they paid on Mary's behalf, right? So these are big changes. Now, I mention this because these are parts, these are parts of the budget, right? And so, and this is what the governor proposed. That's not what the budget's going to end up, right? But, but there is going to be a budget. This isn't like some random piece of legislation that gets proposed and it gets sent off to a study committee and appears five years later. You know, there will be action on the budget. And the question is whether outside Section 11 will be in it. Um, and so you want to be aware of the existence of outside Section 11. You want to keep paying attention to this. If you've got a lawyer, you want to be talking to, to him about or her about how this is going. I will tell you that... So far, the news regarding this is good, and that is the, the, the House Ways and Means Committee last Wednesday reported out to the General House their version of the budget. And the House Ways and Means Committee recommendation did not have outside Section 11 in it, right? So if, if that stays out when the House votes in general, right, and if the same thing happens in the Senate, if the Senate takes out outside Section 11, then outside Section 11 is dead. If the House excludes it, but the Senate leaves it in the Senate budget, right? Outside Section 11 is part of the Senate version of the budget. Then what happens is you probably, once again, you maybe hear about when you, this stuff happens. In that case, when there were two different versions of the budget, it goes to a big conference committee. And each the Senate appoints some members and the House appoints some members and they make deals. And if outside Section 11 is in one but not in the other, then it goes to conference committee to decide what is going to happen. Okay? The reason why that may be of some significance, who is your um, state senator? Karen Spilka. Karen Spilka. Um, do you know what her job is in the state senate? She's the, of the she's the chairman of the Senate Ways and Means Committee. That's the committee that's going to be making the recommendation regarding whether the Senate is going to have outside <coughs> Section 11 in its budget or not. Right? She has more juice than anybody. And she is a very, very competent person, right, who's very sensitive to these issues also, right? So 
you know, if you're interested in this issue, you may want to stay in touch with her office, find out how she's, you know, wh where that's going. But I tell you, she is, I've dealt with her a lot. She's terrific, right? But she's also in power, so she's a big part of this. Okay? But that's it. Any questions? Thank you very, very much for your time and attention. I'm happy to take questions afterwards. Go see the Frank and Mary uh, uh, channel if you've got any questions. And remember, the goal of life is to sleep well at night, right? Hopefully this has been helpful to you, right? That's the goal, though, right? The nice thing about being old, fame and fortune have gone by. The goal of life is to sleep well at night. Thank you very much. Thank Maybe you. we'll see you next time. Thank you.